Hello, everyone. Time once again for Scripture verse by verse, going through the book of Acts. We come today to Acts chapter 9, left off in verse 12 last time. So we'll be in that area when we pick it up in just a minute. I'll give you a minute to get your Bible, and while you're doing that, I'll remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. If you love the Word of God, that's a place to go because you can study the Word of God in its entirety from Genesis through Revelation, all 66 books of the Bible, three complete series going through the Bible at thebibleversebyverse.com. And you can study the Bible from the beginning to the end, or you can study any book that you want, any chapter within that book. It's totally up to you. All you have to do is click and listen. That's at the thebibleversebyverse.com. <clears throat> okay, well, let's pray and get right into the Word of God today. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Saul of Tarsus, who is about to become the Apostle Paul, was a hater of Christians, a hater of Jesus. His sole purpose in life was to destroy Christianity by killing Christians, by throwing them in prison, by opposing Jesus Christ. Well, God Almighty had plans for Saul. He was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. Jesus knocked him off his feet, blinded him, and said, Why are you opposing me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads, Saul. And Saul said, Who are you? What do you want me to do? And Jesus told him, so he's sitting in a room, blind, has been there for three days, not knowing what was going to happen next or if there would be a next in this world. All he knows is that he's been opposing Jesus Christ, and now come to find out he's been opposing God in the process. Scared is probably an understatement as he sits in darkness and waits to see what's going to happen next. Meanwhile, Jesus shows a vision to a Christian in that area named Ananias. And Ananias is told by God to go to a certain place where he will find Saul of Tarsus and lay hands on him and pray for him so that he restores, so that his sight will be restored. And of course, Ananias like every other Christian, knew about Saul of Tarsus. And I don't think he was too thrilled about, about going by Saul of Tarsus. In fact, I know that's the case because notice verse 13. Then Ananias, Ananias answered, Lord, I have, heard, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Were you aware of this, Jesus? You know, Ananias filling Jesus in on, on some information here. Ananias, in other words, is saying, Are you sure you want me to go and talk to this guy? Jesus? He doesn't like you, you know. He doesn't like you. He doesn't like Christians. And that's all true. But isn't it a good thing that Christ does not hold a grudge against those who have offended him, even offended him mightily? Certainly, no one offended Jesus more than Saul of Tarsus, and yet Jesus isn't holding a grudge. He wants to save him. Jesus loves Saul. Doesn't matter how many Christians he has hurt or killed. He loves Saul. He wants him to be saved. He doesn't want to send him to hell. 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, 
for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Saul doesn't know it yet, but Jesus has big plans for him. Saw the Christian killer. Saw the Jesus hater. Saw the religious big shot. Saw the, the zealous Jew. Will become a servant of Jesus Christ. The one he has despised up to this point will soon become his master. People who do not believe that Jesus is the risen Lord always have a hard time explaining the complete reversal in Saul of Tarsus. He had been a Christian killer, a Christian hater, a Jesus despiser, and he's about to become a Christ proclaimer who suffered and eventually will have his head chopped off for the sake of Jesus. How do you explain that unless Jesus really appeared to him and Jesus is who he said he is? So, <clears throat> look at verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Brother Saul, he calls him Brother Saul, and so Ananias also overlooked Saul's sinful past. If Jesus is willing to forgive those who have changed, who have repented, then certainly Ananias must do that, and certainly we must do that as well. You know, the Bible says that we should forgive even as God forgives us. Verse 18, And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight, and arose and was baptized. He was baptized before he did anything else. Seems like he couldn't wait to be identified with Christ and his followers. Just think of that. To be identified with Christ and his followers after spending so much time trying to wipe them out. He couldn't wait to be connected to Jesus publicly. And that is something that is true for everyone who truly repents and receives Christ as Lord and Savior. They want to be identified with Jesus. They're not ashamed of Christ. Verse 19. <clears throat> And when he had received food, he was strengthened. All of a sudden, he got his appetite back, too. You remember, he was sitting in that, in that uh, dark room in darkness because of his blindness for three days. He didn't eat a thing, didn't drink anything either. And now he's right with God through Jesus Christ. Everything's good. And he, all of a sudden, he got his appetite back. One thing that stood out to me, though, is that he was baptized before he had anything to eat or drink. That that's, tells us about his priorities, because he didn't eat or drink for three days. But when a person is serious about Christ, obeying him becomes more important than things generally considered to be necessities. You'd rather obey him and go without necessities if need be. 19 and 20, and when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Boy, did Paul ever have to swallow, or I should say Saul, did he ever have to swallow his pride, huh? Everyone makes mistakes. 
Everyone commits sin. The important thing is to humble yourself before Almighty God and repent and receive Christ and get back on the right track or get on the right track for the first time in your life. That's the important. You know, the people who go to hell aren't the ones who sin because we all sin. The people who go to hell are the ones who do not repent, do not humble themselves before Jesus and receive him as their Lord and Savior, repent and start living for him. Those are the ones who go to hell. But that's what Saul did, see? He started preaching that Jesus is the Son of God, which was also admitting that he had been very, very wrong in the past with terrible and sinful consequences. By preaching Jesus, he was admitting that he was dead wrong and guilty of a horrible sin by persecuting Christians, <clears throat> speaking badly about Jesus, and killing Christians. He caved. It took humility. <clears throat> but he did it. He swallowed his pride. If you're ever going to be saved, you have to be willing to swallow your pride. If you want to be forgiven, you have to be willing to swallow your pride. No excuses. Confess your sin. Admit full guilt. And don't add a but to it. Because <coughs> the moment you add a but to your confession, it ceases to be a, a confession and it turns into an excuse. 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them who called on this name in Jerusalem and came here for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? The amazed people here are not Christians. And that's clear because the people talking about the change in Saul refers to Christians in the third person. So non-Christians were amazed at the change in Saul. What a testimony this was to the reality of Jesus. Verse 22, But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Saul has the Jews all fired up and confused. What in the world is going on with Saul? That's what they're thinking. They didn't understand Saul's changed behavior or his new interpretation of Scripture because he just did a 180 when it comes to Jesus Christ. 23. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. We get to choose our trouble. And this is what I mean. According to Scripture, if people reject Jesus Christ, God will give us plenty of trouble on Judgment Day. If you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to have more than what you can handle on Judgment Day. If you receive Christ and live for Him, then the world is going to give you trouble today. It's not a question of will or will you not have trouble. The question is, what trouble are you going to choose? Trouble from God for all eternity as you're burning in hell or trouble from the unsaved for living for Jesus in this life? That choice is totally up to you. Saul made the, the wise choice. He chose trouble from the world rather than trouble from God. Smart choice. Look at 23 and 24. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their lying in wait was known by Saul. 
and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So the govern the governor of Damascus turns that city into a military fortress just to capture Saul. Notice verse 25. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Saul had faith, and he was willing to put his life on the line and his reputation on the line for Jesus. He certainly had faith in Jesus Christ, but he also used common sense. You know, if, if you can avoid trouble without violating Scripture, then by all means, avoid that trouble. You just can't avoid trouble. You shouldn't attempt to avoid trouble by going outside the boundaries of Scripture. Then you've made a God out of your comfort. Always put God first. Always put Jesus first. 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he tried to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Well, you know, the, the, the rest of the gang at, in Jerusalem is going to have a lot of unlearning to do concerning Saul. The Christians in Jerusalem, remember, suffered an awful lot of persecution because of Saul. And that's why they were suspicious. They're not just going to take his word for it. They thought that he was trying to trick him. This was just another, this was just another ploy by Saul to, get, to infiltrate Christians to kill him. But Saul proved his faith was real by his willingness to suffer for Jesus Christ. Notice verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas, is, this guy was willing to suffer for Jesus. He had the whole city, the governor, and everybody turned against him, but he just kept preaching the word of God. We got him out of there by the skin of his teeth, letting him down in a basket over the side of the wall at night. He's proven he's a Christian. He's willing to suffer for Jesus. And good old Barnabas, he was a kind soul. He always seemed to give people the benefit of the doubt. While others didn't trust Saul, Barnabas stood by him. You know, those Barnabas people are kind of nice to have around once in a while, aren't they? Especially if you need a friend and you can't find one. Somebody who just accepts you and gives you the benefit of the doubt. They look at the track record. They, they look at the evidence. They look at your heart the best they can. They give you the benefit of the doubt. In spite of all your failures, they stand by you. They like you. They help you. Kind of nice to have those guys around every once in a while. Verse 28. And he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. The Grecian Jews could not out-debate out Saul. He, he got in a debate with them, and they lost. They were backed into the corner. They could not out-debate Saul when it came to Jesus Christ in the Scripture, and they could not out-reason Saul, so they decided to kill him. Typical. Typical religious leaders of that day, typical of sinfully prideful people today. Verse 30. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. And so Paul escapes death again, and this time returns to his home in Tarsus. 31. Then had the churches 
rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were, were multiplied. The Jews left the Christians alone for a while because they had too many other problems to be concerned with at this particular time. We know this from history. Almighty God used these circumstances to give his church a breather from persecution. The Jews were dealing with the emperor Caligula, who was trying to set his image up in the temple and make the Jews worship it. And the Jews, when they made a fuss about that, which of course they would, Rome made war with them. So they had their hands full. They didn't have time to pick on Christians. Verse 32. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints who dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And so this man was a paralytic, and I'm sure he tried many different cures, but of course nothing worked. So by this time, he was without hope. He had absolutely no hope at all of ever walking again. And he's going to find out, though, that Jesus Christ is not restrained by either our lack of faith or lack of hope. The power of Jesus Christ is not a puppet that is controlled by our faith or lack thereof or hope or lack thereof. Verse 34. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee well. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. In other words, you're healed, so start acting like it. You're healed, so start acting like it. Not a bad suggestion in the spiritual realm for Christians today. Jesus Christ, through the power of Jesus, just like this man walked, through the power of Jesus, Almighty God has declared that we have the power to control sin, to turn away from sin. So there is no reason, no reason at all for a Christian to live like a victim of sin. And no, we don't need counseling, and we don't need psychological help, and we don't need 12-step programs. We've got everything that we need resident in us, in the Holy Spirit who lives in us, to overcome any sin instantaneously by simply making that choice. I didn't say it would be easy to say no to your sin nature. I'm saying you can do it. You can do it by the power of God. Jesus Christ has delivered you. Now act like it. Do it. God says in his word, put off the old man. Put on the new man. It's as simple as making a choice every time you are tempted. And don't let anyone tell you that it's anything more complicated than that, because it isn't. That is the testimony of Scripture. 35. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. And there's a powerful testimony. The man who couldn't walk was healed in Jesus' name, and he got up and he walked. And no other so-called God could do the things that Jesus was doing through his apostles. The exact same things that he was doing when he was here on earth in person. Jesus is alive. Jesus is real. Jesus is God. He has to be. 
or he could not do these miracles either by himself when he was here or through his apostles when they do it in his name. He has to be God. He has to be alive. He has to be real or he couldn't do these miracles. And the people recognized those things and as a result, repented and started to follow Christ. 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Tabitha was a wonderful Christian woman. Doesn't say that she said great things. It says that she did great things. She was a giver. She gave her time. She gave her money to the service of her Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, as a byproduct of that, she was helping people. 37. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid in an upper chamber. So generous people are promised care by God. But even good men and good women like her have to eventually pass away. Of course, death was good news for Tabitha, but it was bad news for everyone who will miss the kindness of that godly woman. Verse 38, And for as much as Lydda was near to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. And so God sometimes heals today in answer to prayer. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when it is his purpose to heal, he can do it and he does do it in answer to prayer. But the apostles were clearly endowed with a special gift of healing. Why else would these Christian disciples send for Peter rather than just, you know, offering up a prayer for Dorcas? They send for Peter because they knew he had the gift of healing, even raising people from the dead. Verse 39. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. And so she was a, a good person, very kind, a real servant. And people just were so broken over her death. And they're telling Peter all about her, what a wonderful woman she was. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turning to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he, was, when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a Tanner. The apostles, like I have mentioned before, were extensions of Jesus Christ doing miracles in the early church to show that the message of Christ and the message of Christianity was authentic and people are getting saved. It wasn't done as a show. It wasn't done to draw attention to the apostles. It was done to draw attention to the reality of Jesus Christ. I got to stop, but you can continue studying the word of God at the Bible verse by verse.com. Study the Word of God from Genesis through Revelation at your pace, at your convenience, using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out. And while you're there, please remember that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. I'm not underwritten by large church or denomination. So if you want to be a part of this ministry, pray for me and pray for 
uh, scripture verse by verse, and also click the donate button at the top of the front page and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead.